Thank you very much. Are there questions? I see Justin already raising his hand. Yes. Um, just kind of a general question about um, uh, the, the surrogate machine learning methods. Um, and I'm just wondering how you, you know, from a, from a research perspective, <clears throat> how you build sufficient confidence in the surrogate model um, to be able to trust using it without always having to check uh, its predictions by doing the corresponding DFT calculations, which of course would defeat the purpose. I, just from a statistical perspective, I would be more inclined to trust it in the role of interpolation, sort of interpolating between uh, points within the uh, training data rather than extrapolation. But ideally, you'd want uh, a, a model that you could do whatever you needed to do with. And I'm just wondering how you get to the point where you trust it enough to, to be able to use it as a research tool. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely see your point. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, at, at the moment, we don't have anything in MALA that, um, that performs such a check automatically. So in the moment, we, we would just get to a new system, perform the prediction and be and well take the result for what it is uh what uh, one route that i think would be worth mentioning here is that uh this that uh, um we could use the uh, magnitude of the local density of states sort of as a, as a sanity check at the end because it should be within certain ranges and if it exceeds that drastically then there's, then there's something wrong um but in in general, um, we haven't we haven't included anything for that yet. I think Steve is looking into this. Okay, thank you. Please raise your hand, Tim. Um, I have kind of a, a related question. Uh, is do do you always train on the mean absolute error? Or is that what you basically minimize? Thanks. So, sorry, I didn't understand the, the first part of the question. Sorry, uh, do you always, in your sort of, I mean, I, I'm not really familiar with these machine learning models, but is it always the mean absolute error in the energy? Is that the sort of quantity that you minimize when you train or? Oh, no, no, it, it's not. Okay. It, um, what um, we minimize is the prediction of the LDOS. So the error in the, the actual LDOS. And as a measure for, for the error there, we use simply, um, I think it's for the most, it's variable, but I think for the most investigations, there was just a, some sort of quadratic loss function there. And then the mean absolute er average error of the energy, that's sort of a post-processing um, thing. And it's what we're overall most interested in, but it's not what we use during training because that's also not always possible. Yeah, it's just because I saw this paper um, recently doing like machine learning uh, in, in quantum chemistry. And they basically kind of say that when you have like a, a sort of non-normal um, distribution of errors, then the mean average error isn't um, often like the best thing to train towards. But I, I mean, yeah, I'm kind of a bit, a bit new to this stuff. But there's, there's, yeah. there's one thing you might, you might want to have a look at is, is what Nico's book is also doing in normalizing, using normalizing flows where you basically go to a distribution of your data set that is always Gaussian, so that your distribution of errors in the end tends to be rather easy. But this, of course, um, mm. then needs to take into account or needs to know the, the error distribution quite well. But then it's basically a transformation of that error uh, distribution to a Gaussian one. So oh. basically, so this is something very interesting they're currently doing together with, with Nico. Mm -hmm.
any more questions? I had Atina. Yes, he's, uh, he's become a group of interacting particles in the bubble chambers. So I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, you you answered the question, or you I wanted to comment on um, also on what Justin asked about uncertainties in the neural networks. And it's absolutely true that this is something we haven't looked at yet. And actually what you suggested, uh, Michael, is exactly what we want to look at. So the Gaussian maximum likelihood estimation is one way maybe to quantify uncertainties in neural networks. And we need that for the active learning. So we cannot really do active learning without some measure of uncertainty. And this is something, one of the things on our list that we want to look at. But yeah, just wanted to oh. comment on that. Also, there is somebody joining, joining classes pretty soon who's working with, together with Nico already on out, on out of distribution detection. So when you know that your predict, how, how to quantify that your prediction is basically not within your desired distribution that you already know from your data. Yeah, that, that would be very interesting. Maybe a follow-up question to Lens uh, to your talk. Um, mm -hmm. you, could you give us an idea on the, the computational cost? Let's say uh, amount of computational cost for DFT training data generation versus training versus inference of the neural network, just to give a rough, rough idea. Um, um, mm -hmm. um, I'm so, so for example, for the um, article that you and your uh, research group in, in Sandia uh, wrote, Attila, I'm not sure, do you remember how, how long the DFT calculation took for you there? Because I also did the experiment, so I can say something about the training and inference, but I'm not quite sure of how long you took for the DFT calculations. Yeah, so in that case, it takes, so for one snapshot, the DFT calculation, well, there are two sets, right? One is the generation of the snapshots, which can take, uh, at, for this large system of 256 atoms, it can take a few hours, maybe one day, to run the trajectories. And from this trajectory, you sample a certain number of snapshots. And then the second part is the local density of states calculation. and that takes again one day, roughly speaking, or eight hours on, on a regular HPC platform on let's say a few nodes. Uh, let's say it has of the order of 30 cores, 36 cores maybe, and four nodes, roughly speaking. This was roughly the cost on in the in the work of Sandia. Okay, okay. Yeah, then then I mean for the for the training. Um... I think both the 298 uh, Kelvin, so the 298 Kelvin model that used only one atomic configuration as training, that is, I think that was done in in a few hours, um, the, the training and then the inference is, is fairly quick that um, I think something in the, in, the, in the range of half an hour, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure also I wasn't using the most, uh, uh, wasn't using a very good parallelization of lamps, but something so in, in this order. So yeah, I think the, the training is a couple. What was a couple of hours, and um, the inference was something around half an hour, maybe. That's quite long for an inference. On which on which system did you use it on your laptop or? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, well, so it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a neural network that was taking so long. It was the problem is was lamps in this case. I think I was using a sub optimal version of lamps because when you do inference, you still you still have to generate. I have to unfortunately go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Well, but to answer Michael's question is absent <laughs> to others that might be interested. Um, you still have to um, to create the atomic descriptors from the atomic positions, and for this. Um, one has to use lamps, and I was using lamps without any parallelization on at all, and that took a while. I'm sure that you can get it down to very few minutes, if not seconds, by simply doing that step more sophisticated, um, which I wasn't doing. So 
the inference itself from the network that was way fast. There was the bottleneck is really the, the generation of the descriptors, and there's a lot of speed up to gain there as well. Are there other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, one thing maybe is uh, just more in the spirit of casus, do you see, where do you see maybe with, uh, with what you're doing with the machine learning, do you see any um, points of contact with other areas in casus? I'm just, just to kind of see and if, it's more like a creative question and uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I, um, I have to say that I'm unfortunately still um, unaware of some of the, the great work that has been done at Casas due to the whole situation that it's harder to connect at the moment um, than when, when, when everyone is at the office. But um, I think uh, a lot of the problems with Mala arise from, from uh, representation of data. And I think there are definitely some overlaps there. When I think two weeks ago, um, there was there was this uh, presentation uh, from someone that Ulrich had invited. I have unfortunately forgotten uh, the name of the presenter, but on this um, uh, particle uh, representation technique, uh, I think something like this would be uh, could be very useful for Mala as well because we're representing the data on a per grid point basis. Okay. Then final chance for questions. Maybe I'll, I'll just pass in really quickly. Sure, um, no, please. If you, if the data generation is is kind of a slow stage, the DFT. Have you considered using like these linear scaling DFT codes, like uh, one tap or instead of quantum espresso, or is that is that not really the issue? Maybe I didn't. Um, so, I mean, I personally haven't thought about that. Um, I think I think the idea is um, to uh, to have the surrogate model with a, with a high accuracy. So I think the the price that we pay for that by, for example, having uh, longer training data data generation runs is worth it at the end because we hope so. to have a surrogate model that can be applied plentiful. Um, and uh, makes up for the time that we take in data train data generation. Okay. Maybe the last thing, uh, if there are no more questions to mention is that it could be interesting. I've not thought about it also much. That's why I asked the question about other connection points with other people, but I'm pretty sure there are other people at Casus doing surrogate modeling. So it would be very interesting to, to connect. So if you do surrogate modeling and you are curious about the workflow, then please contact Lens or me. But, uh, but likewise, I think we're interested in other workflows that, that people maybe develop at Casus. Yeah, definitely. And I'm not, also not fully aware of what is going on. So it would be nice if you, if you just uh, shoot us, send us a mes message if you do if you have a similar workflow, but in a completely different context, for example. And yeah, definitely. I think there's uh, there's always things that we could that we could improve. So then it doesn't seem like there are more questions. I'll thank Lance again for presenting his work and giving the talk. Thanks again. And uh, have a nice afternoon, everyone. Yes. Uh, so, thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Yeah.